the ministry. They don't go unnoticed. Psalm chapter 86 today. A cry for help. While you're turning there, Psalm chapter 86 gives us a very helpful lesson on praying. Especially in times of affliction. This book of Psalms is actually divided into five different books. It's divided into book one, which is chapters one through forty-one, book two, which is chapters forty-two through seventy-two, book three, which is chapter seventy-three through eighty-nine, book four, which is chapter ninety through one hundred six, and then finally book five, which is chapters one hundred and seven through one hundred and fifty. Why do I mention this? It is because the third book, the divisions of chapters between 73 and 89, Psalms 86 is the only psalm that is written by David in that book. The psalm is not known for its originality as many of the phrases and many of the verses can be referred to in other parts of the scriptures. But it's this lack of originality that I think we can get a profound lesson on how we should pray about things today. David has searched the scriptures David had even remembered the things that he had penned in the scriptures. David had walked along life's road to this point experiencing both good and bad events within his life. And when it came time to pray, it wasn't necessarily an original prayer, but it was one that used God's word as well as the lived experiences of his life that he applied in his prayer to seek God's help. We often find ourselves guilty of cautioning each other about repetitive prayers. And we, we should know that the power within our prayer is not in the actual words that we speak. The power in our prayer is in the sincerity of our heart. It is in our ability to seek the reality of God through our prayer. David, Psalms 86, is a psalm that is very heartfelt. This psalm is compassionate. This psalm is a desperate cry for help from a man of God that is in a time of great affliction. David is not just crying out with words for God's help, but he is dedicating his actions. David is dedicating his life. He is dedicating his heart to cling to his God, whom he knew could and would deliver. I dare say this morning that it would be inactive by looking around this congregation. And based statistically off of pure numbers, there are some people here today that is currently living with a great affliction in their life. Hopefully this song can shed light on our Savior's love and how we can cry for help in our prayer to our Lord. Our God, who has the power to deliver us out of any type of bondage, is who we should seek. For those that may not have a great affliction today, beware, because affliction will be waiting just around the corner. May we learn from this psalm and be prepared to call upon God with a heartfelt request the next time we become afflicted. As we read this psalm, may we keep the primary objective of Psalms chapter 86 in mind. This primary objective is to show is our status of being poor and needy. And it is that status that should promote prayer from our hearts to call out to our great God, to whom alone and with all sufficiency can and will deliver us from anything in our life. Psalms chapter 86, I'm going to read the whole chapter. (coughs) Bow down thou ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in all mercy, and all them that count upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations to whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and 
doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify thy name forever. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thy handmaid. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou, Lord, hast opened me and comforted me. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the day. I thank you for everything that you have given us. I thank you again for allowing us to meet in your house to worship you. And Lord, I just pray for the next few moments, Lord, that you can just remove all distractions, Lord, and clear our minds and allow us to focus on what you would have for us. Lord, that we may be open of our hearts and our minds, be attentive to your speaking, Lord, that you can show us things that we need to learn to be better servants for you. And Lord, as we always pray, if there be anyone in your house this morning, Lord, does not know you as their Savior, we pray that they, that they get that settled today, that they can know today that they can have eternity with you in heaven. And Lord, I just thank you for this church and thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do today and what you're going to do tonight and what you're going to do for the rest of our time. And we just give you the honor and glory for everything. In Christ's name I pray. Psalms 86 is full of many, many requests. This morning I want to break this psalm down into five different sections. The who, what, when, how, and why of prayer. First, why should we pray? Because we are all poor in need. It don't matter if our earthly riches spiritually each and every one of us today no matter what level we are on are poor in need verse 1 we see David says bow down thine ear O Lord and hear me for I am poor in need we see in verse 2 where David says preserve my soul and then in verse 16 he says save thy son we also see that David was in a time of affliction from verse 7 he cried out in the day of my trouble and then also, he with much more detail tells us of the violent men that were out to get him in verse 14. You see, David knew that he was in a situation that he could do absolutely nothing about. David knew that he was in a situation that he could not save himself from. But rather, David knew that he had to rely on his holy God to deliver him. It would seem, you know, elementary, my dear Watsons, for me to tell you all today that our needs is what should drive us to pray. But the truth is, we are often blinded by pride to see the true needs that we really do have. When we become blinded by pride, we begin to look at our problems, and we begin to rely on ourselves. We begin to rely on our friends, and we begin to rely on other things from this world that will deliver us from our troubles. Why is it that in today's standards, it seems all too often that it, it is only after we've gone to the bottom of the barrel and we have come to the point that we've realized that nothing else works that we finally say the only thing left to do is to pray. I believe recalling it John Bunyan that said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. And this is true. Why should we pray? Why should we pray? First, we need to realize that our prayer life should be a primary response. It should be our first thought, not our last resort. Christians were often oblivious to the power of the devil who really is roaring about as a roaring lion, seeking to devour and seeking to destroy. Christians, we do have a pull from within us. That, is, that pull is a sin nature that we were born with. 
as Galatians 5, 17 reminds us. This is why we should pray. For anyone who may be here today, and they may say, I don't know that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I've ever accepted Christ into my heart. Why should you pray? Because you have no greater need than the need of forgiveness and the need of salvation that can only be given to you through the blood of Jesus Christ that He shed on the cross of Calvary. You see, to sum it up, everybody here today has a need <coughs> to pray. Why should we pray? Because we are poor and we are needy. Will we seek Him today in our prayer life? The second thing, who should we pray to? Who should we pray to? Knowing God's attributes and knowing His promises gives us both hope and strength within our prayers. Our text in verse 5 tells us that for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Verse 15 of our text tells us, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. I'll take you back to Psalm 102 in the first verse, when he says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. You see, we have no righteousness of our own to plead. Therefore, we must plead God's own righteousness for us in our life. It is only through Him. Who should we pray to? We should only be praying to the only God, the living God, the true God, the God that is great in power, great in mercy, great in love, great in grace. Verse 8 through 10 of our text, read again. It says, Among the gods, and that's the little g gods, there is none like thee, O Lord, neither are there any works from any of the little g gods that are worshipped upon this earth that compare to the works of our Heavenly Father. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O God, the living God, the true God. And then in verse 10, For thou art great, and thou doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. There's only one God that we should pray to. There's only one God that can hear our prayers. There's only one God that can answer our prayers. Who should we pray to? The God alone. The true God, the living God, that's great in mercy, love, grace, and power. The word Lord here in this specific passage is translated seven times, and it's translated to the Hebrew word Adonai. Adonai emphasizes God's greatness. Adonai emphasizes God's lordship, his sovereignty. It says God is the creator and God is the doer of the most great and wondrous acts. God has even proclaimed that all of the world will eventually fall before him someday as he is God and he is God alone. We know that the world is full of the little g gods that David has referred to in verse 8. Our society today has got people worshiping idols of little g gods all throughout the world. This world is full of evil. It's full of idols. It's full of demonic activity. And may each of us today who has accepted Christ and our Savior, as Christ is our Savior, we've accepted Him in our hearts. May we just reclaim 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, that greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. This is where our confidence should lie within our prayers. Within our time of affliction, we can have confidence concerning our prayer life because we know why we should pray, but we also know who we are praying to. The evils of this world are powerful, but not a one of them, not a one of them even combined with all of the others, can even remotely come close to the power of our God. If there's someone here today that is following the Lord, but you are struggling with something that is beyond your ability to handle, May I remind you that we pray to a God who is sitting in His throne, alive today, resurrected. And God has extended us mercy and His grace for our time of need. It is a promise, and God fulfills all of His promises. Another thing that uplifts me is the fact that this grace and this mercy that God has for us, it's abundant. And what does that mean? It means we can never exhaust our God's love. We can never exhaust our God's mercy, and we cannot ever exhaust our God's grace. 
Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 tells us, So let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and we may find grace in our time of need. You see, this applies to all of us today, but I feel the need to stop here and ask again, is there anyone here today that may say, Pastor, I've never come to this throne of grace. I don't know Christ as my Savior. I may not have received access to God the Father. Let me tell you that today is the plan. Or to, today it is God's plan for you to receive Him and come to know Him as your Savior. The Bible tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is because of that sin that man is appointed to die. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But, by faith, God commended His love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, that is where belief in Him to not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 13 tells us, For whosoever shall call upon the, the what? The name of our Lord. Whosoever shall pray to God, the only true God, the living God, the God great in mercy, the God great in power, great in grace, great in compassion, and great in everything else that we could ever want. <coughs> For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The day is the day of salvation. The God who gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for your sins is who we shall call upon. No greater thing could happen this morning in our service than for somebody to settle this. No greater thing could we experience this morning than for somebody to walk down the aisle and accept Christ as their Savior. It would be worth ever trouble. It would be worth ever trial. I found this illustration that seems to fit perfectly that we can all relate to. We are all poor and we're needy. But suppose we did encounter a super rich multi-billionaire. And this multi-billionaire actually looked us in the face and they told us, I've got more money than I can ever spend. If there's anything that you need, all you need to do is ask and I will take care of your needs. How many of us would seek out that billionaire on a regular basis and ask for our needs to be met? How often would we seek them and ask them for help? I feel the need to, to remind us today that our God is richer than all of the rich combined. And how often do we seek Him and ask Him for our help? When we seek help from our Lord, we don't have to fill out an application. We don't even have to justify our needs. We don't have to stand in a line we don't have to worry about imposing on anyone's time as God is not bound by time. We can just boldly go to our loving Father through prayer and present our needs. Why do we not do it as often as we need to? If we have sinned this morning, He is ready to forgive our sins. If we feel like we do not deserve His blessings, remember that grace is made and made abundantly for the undeserved. His loving kindness is abundant to all who pray to Him. Why we pray is because we are poor and we are needy. And to whom we pray is to the God who is great in power, great in love, and great in mercy. The next point I want to look at is when should we pray? This is the simplest point that I have today. I'm going to point you to 1 Thessalonians 5.17, a simple verse, three words. It says, Pray without ceasing. Pray always. Pray always. When Paul wrote these words in Thessalonians, his admonition is that we should include God in all of our thoughts as we go throughout all parts and all aspects of every day that we live. You see, not all prayers have to be a formal, extensive conversation that we are bowed before God on our knees. Those are good, and those are needed, and those are important within our Christian life. But sometimes we should just simply pray without ceasing. We should pray in the morning time. We should pray in the afternoon. We should pray in the evening. We should pray when we wake up unexpectedly. 
We should pray when we drive. We should pray when we walk. Even pray when you're on a break at work. Hey, here's one for you. I even tried it yesterday. Instead of singing in the shower, I prayed in the shower. My wife finally didn't throw anything at me. We can pray always. We should pray without ceasing. When should we pray? Always. Just pray always. Pray without ceasing. So again, why we pray is because we are poor and needy. To whom we pray is to the true God, the only living God, the God great in mercy, great in love, great in power, great in compassion, and great in everything else that we can give Him credit for. And when should we pray? We should pray always and without ceasing. Our fourth point I want to look at is the how should we pray. How should we pray? First, we should pray earnestly. David obviously had a very close relationship with God. And when David prayed, he done so in a very earnest fashion. David's prayer was a true cry for help to a God who would save him from his affliction. Our prayers should be full of intent, and our prayers should be full of heartfelt requests. I want to give you another illustration. If you can, try to picture two homeless people sitting on the street, holding signs that are identical. Both say homeless and hungry. Please help. One of the people is sitting on the guardrail holding the sign up and looking around while the other one is actually up walking up and down the white line at the intersection, making eye contact with all the passersby, and even, even voicing his need for help. Who are we most inclined to help? They're both poor. They're both mean. They're both asking the same thing. But is one not more heartfelt than the other? Is one not more a genuine reach for help? If we pray like the one sitting down, if we pray a formality, that we pray only because we have been taught that we should pray, and we've been taught that we should ask God for help, then expect the same level of reward. But if we can learn to pray earnestly and with heartfelt emotions, that we really do need help, that we need the Lord's grace and mercy more than anything. And we only understand, and we understand that we only have God to lean upon. We will be more inclined to be more blessed. How should we pray? First off, we should pray earnestly. Then we should pray continually. As verse 3 of our text says, O Lord, I cry unto thee daily. Pray without ceasing, pray always. Cry unto the Lord daily. This idea is that, that we should keep coming back and back and back again to prayer all throughout our day. Pray continually. And then we should pray thankfully. David wrote in verse 12, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. We have looked at 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and it says, Pray without ceasing. But here under pray thankfully, let's continue to 1 Thessalonians 5.18, where it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. If you cry out for help, if you're in a time of great affliction, pray thankfully that God allows you to be in that situation, because He will deliver you from it. Pray thankfully to God, even in the midst of our troubles, because we can be thankful that He has suffered more than we ever will. We can be thankful that He gave us more than we could ever give Him back. And we can be thankful that He has promised us that He is working in us, even during our trials, to complete His work, which will be to a greater good of all. Pray thankfully. We should also pray humbly. David did not pray in anger because of his affliction. He didn't even complain because the Lord had allowed him to be in this state. In verse 3 and 16, we see that David humbly cried, Be merciful unto me. In verse 2, 4 and 16, he cried out to God as simply God's servant and nothing more than a humble servant 
of the Lord. In verse 16, he also asked for strength. And you see, it wasn't what David could do for God. David had come to the point in his affliction that he understood that it is not what he could do for God, but it is only what God can do for David. And that's why he was crying out for help in his prayer. We struggle today with pride. We struggle today as a society on the value that others place in us as individuals. How much harder must it have been for David, I remind you, that David wasn't just an individual. David was a king. And he was humble and bowing before God. Think of if our politicians today and imagine how different we could be if they would earnestly, if they would continually, if they would thankfully, and if they would humbly fall before God Almighty. Wouldn't be the same world, would it? You see, but this don't apply to David. It don't just apply to what our politicians should be doing. It applies to us that we should humbly go before the Lord in prayer. We are poor and mean. We are servants. And we need Him to be merciful unto us. May we all acknowledge our weaknesses. And may we acknowledge our need for God's strength. And may each of us today commit that it is these weaknesses and it is these needs that make us dependent upon God's ability to overcome and God's ability to provide for us. We pray earnestly, we pray continually, thankfully, and humbly. And finally, under the how to pray, may we pray in faith. May we pray in faith. Verse 2 shows that David affirmed his trust in God. Verse number 7 of our text says, For thou wilt answer me. David knew that he would answer me. He had faith that God would answer him. Verse 13, David proclaimed that God had already delivered him from the low of hell. Verse 17 says, Lord, just show me a token for good. And that was a sign that David had faith that God would deliver him. But then David even took it a step further and David said, This token will show my enemies that you are God. Often we want ourselves to be removed from our time of affliction so we can be free from it. But we forget that as Christians, when God works in our life and when God speaks to us and when God makes things better, that is the living testimony that our God shows our enemies and that our God shows the world. Faith rests upon God's power. And God's abundant love being real within our life. Faith is us understanding that if we ask God for something that can be used for His glory and for our good, God will do it. Pray with faith and expect God to deliver you from your affliction in this time. He has already promised it. He can meet our needs. Now that we've looked at the why we pray, who we pray, when and how, I want to look at our final point. What shall we pray for? What shall we pray for? First and foremost, we should pray for salvation. In our context, we see that David prayed for deliverance from his enemies. And as we sit here today, the context that we can apply is that we may pray for the salvation of all, that they may be saved from God's judgment. Jesus came as the Savior that all the world may be saved. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. You see, Christ died to save sinners. And if you have never accepted Him as your Savior, then again I plead with you today that this is your primary need. Will you get it saved? He's already paid the price. The free gift of salvation is waiting before you. For those that call upon the name of the Lord, the true God, the living God, the God great in mercy, great in power, great in compassion, great in love, and great in grace. Will you call upon Him today? The second thing that what shall we pray for is pray for joy in our afflictions. We should pray for joy within our afflictions. Chapter 86, verse 4 of our text says, David prayed that the Lord could give him rejoice in his soul. 
You see, David didn't ask for the happiness to come after the affliction was gone. David simply rather asked that God would give him reason to rejoice in his afflictions. And David done that because he understood who God really is. <coughs> if we understand who God really is today, we can ask for joy in our time of affliction. Because we know who's in control, and we know as from previous sermons that God has given us an expected end. He is, under, he is in control. He knows what's going to take place. He will deliver us in His time, in His way. The third thing that we should pray for is that we should pray that we are teachable. We should pray for a teachable heart. Focus on verse 11 here when He says, Teach me thy ways, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. The number one thing that any Christian should have is a teachable heart. I know when I've, I've done many interviews and I've been able to be the supervisor over many paramedics and EMTs, I don't care how good their skills are when they come into employment. I can teach them skills. I need to know that, that person is teachable. And that's what God needs from us today. It ain't how great of a Christian we can be. It ain't how far we can reach out and do for the Lord. It's how teachable our heart is and how often we're willing to seek God and allow Him to show us what He would have us do. How many of us find ourselves in trouble and we're immediately asking God for deliverance from that trouble? May today we focus on having a teachable heart. And if we truly have a teachable heart, then we can learn to, we can learn God's ways. And when we learn God's ways, we will hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against Him. If we are teachable, we will find that we truly will be more devoted to God. We will find that we will fear God's holy name. And we will also be more reverent to Him as our Lord and our Savior. We should also pray for God's glory. David prophesied that all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee. O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Verse 12, David reaffirmed that he will glorify the name of God forever. Psalms 50 and 15 says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. One reason that God brings trials into our lives is so that we will call upon Him as His children. God allows us to be in times of affliction, in times of trouble, because when we get there, we will cry out for help to our Lord and our Savior. Look today not in what our troubles or our afflictions are, but look today to magnify God in our prayer and in all of our lives. In conclusion, may we understand that we need to pray because we are a poor and we are a needy people. We shall only pray to God, the true God, again, the God of power, the God of mercy, the God of compassion, the God of love, and the God of grace. Adonai. We should always pray, and we should pray without ceasing. How shall we pray? Let's today learn to pray earnestly, continually, Thankfully, humbly, and shall we always pray with an abounding faith that He will deliver us. What shall we pray for? First and foremost, pray for the salvation. Pray for joy in our times of trouble. Pray that we are teachable, and pray that God's glory will fill our every aspect of our life for He will meet our needs. And whatever we do during each trial or affliction that we may face, may we never forget Psalms 86, 5 of this text. For Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon Thee. The invitation this morning is going to be pretty straightforward. In just a few minutes, our musicians are going to come. We're going to play a song. We're going to open the altar. This morning, is there anything that we need to pray for? Anything. 
salvation, the altar will be open. If you're in a time of trouble or a time of affliction, the altar will be open. If you've lost the joy, God will meet you. And God will fix it. You know what God has spoken to you about this morning. Will you settle it today? If there be anything else on your mind, the altar is open. I can't help you. I'll try. But God can. The God, the living God, the only God. Shall we pray without ceasing? Then we close the chapter with Thou, Lord, has opened me and comforted me. That is, Thou, Lord, has helped me, and Thou, Lord, has comforted me. And that He will do for us today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the psalms that you have preserved and given to us. And Lord, I just pray that you will allow us to, to use this word today that we can strengthen our prayer life, Lord. And first and foremost, we pray again that there be anyone in your house this morning does not know you as their Savior, that they'll just get that settled before it's eternally too late. And Lord, if there's anyone in time of affliction, it is you who can help. May we cry out to you, the only God, the true God. May we pray without ceasing. May we learn how to pray and what to pray for. May we just seek your will because we know in the end that will help us and that will comfort us. Lord, I just pray that you be with this invitation. Be with the, the closing of the service, Lord, the most important part that we just get everything settled. <coughs> that we just don't leave anything unattended to, Lord, if you put a call upon our life, that we can be faithful to answer and that you can use us to be servants for you to reach this community with the gospel of Christ. Lord, we'll thank you for everything. We we'll praise you in your, your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>